44 years ago, Britain was at war with the IRA. In their deadliest attack on the mainland, 21 people were murdered in Birmingham after bombs exploded in two pubs. I think this is uh, murder, I think this is. Six Irishmen were wrongly convicted of mass murder. For 16 and a half years, we have been being used as plenty of scapegoats. Since then, the police have investigated without success. I didn't do it. No, I didn't say you did. With a new inquest now opened, the relatives of the victims are still desperate for answers. What do I want? Me, personally, I want the bastards who killed my sister and the other 20 to be brought to justice, short and simple. My name is John Ware. For decades, I covered the Northern Ireland conflict. I'm at the top of the escalator. He's at the top of the escalator. Several names have been linked to the Birmingham pub bombings. I got him. Let's go. But mystery surrounds who actually planted the bombs. Tonight, we investigate the prime suspects. Did you plant the bombs in the Birmingham pubs that killed 21 people? At 8.17 on November the 21st, 1974, drinkers in the Mulberry Bush pub in Birmingham say the lights suddenly went out. Minutes later, 300 yards away, drinkers in the tavern in the town recall a blue flash followed by total darkness. Reports are coming in of a bomb attack in the centre of Birmingham. Two bombs, thought to contain at least 25 pounds of explosives, had detonated. There was bodies on top of me and the pillar gave out way and we were trapped under it. My hands going straight to my face and feeling blood and burning. Eyes went, ears went, everything went black. All of a sudden, the ceiling started coming down. It must have been plaster of some or other. And I tried to move, which I couldn't. And it started, you know, it was building up higher and higher. And I couldn't breathe. John Plimmer, an off-duty detective, heard the explosion at the tavern and rushed to help. So here it is. Yeah. Here. Where we've got this doorway was one big black hole. And we did a lot of smoke coming up out of it. And then next door, the radio rentals, that is virtually the same right. as it was then. Right. But all the glass had come out was on the pavement. Mm. I went down the steps that were still intact, and the only light available was from electrical overhead cables just touching each other and just sparking. There were people groaning. It was a smoky atmosphere. I mean, it was an awful sickening sight with a sickening smell of cordite. And it was just a case of getting as many people out of there as possible. Twenty-one people were murdered. Two hundred and twenty were injured. Julie Hamilton lost her elder sister, Maxine. Julie, good morning. Hello, John. We were walking home from school, and um, we got in the house, and um, our stepfather was, was there, and I always remember he was closing the curtains. I mean, it was still light then, even though it was November, it was still light, and I thought, why is he closing the curtains? And uh, he sat us down and he said, um, you know, Maxine was going to town last night to meet her friends. And we said, oh, is she all right? Because we'd heard the news on the telly. 
and we said, is she hurt? Is she okay? And he said, no, she's not hurt. And you have that moment of relief. And then he said, she was killed. Can you remember the last time that you saw Maxine? She'd come round and she'd stayed the night. The next morning, I was get running around getting ready for school. And I went to go running out the front door and Mum said, aren't you going to go and say goodbye to Mackie? Because we called her Mackie. And I said, oh, yeah, I, I forgot. I ran up the stairs. <sighs> and um, I flung my head, my hands around, uh, jumped on the bed and said, I'll see you Friday back in. Within three hours of the bombings, the police had arrested five Irishmen en route to Belfast. A sixth man was later picked up in Birmingham. Four of the men confessed. They insisted they only did so because they'd been brutally beaten and tortured. They became known as the Birmingham Six. One year ago, six IRA terrorists recruited in Birmingham planted bombs in two city centre pubs. The following year, 1975, the Birmingham Six were convicted of 21 murders. Doubts were soon raised about the convictions, Chris Mullin is a journalist, author, and former government minister. He wrote a book exposing flaws in the forensic evidence and alleged police misconduct. But Mullin wanted to go further. It was obvious that the case against them was weak, but I concluded that the only way of proving that they didn't do it uh, was to track down the people who had done it and persuade them to uh, own up in sufficient detail as to make it impossible to pretend that the right people were still inside. And Mullin did just that, concluding that four men were really responsible for the bombings. They agreed to talk to him, provided he didn't name them in the book. Some have since been named, but mystery still surrounds the identities of the two men who planted the bombs which killed 21 people. Mullin cryptically dubbed them the young planter and the older planter. He wrote in his book that the young planter even confessed to him. Eventually, I said to him, I think you were in the pumps. There was a long silence. We were sitting on the floor. He stared straight ahead, smoking and then it all came out. Mullen did not campaign alone. He worked with ITV's World in Action on a series of programmes challenging the police case. In 1990, Mullen again interviewed the man he called the Young Planter, this time heavily disguised for World in Action's cameras. That was me. This man is confessing to mass murder, the indiscriminate slaughter of 21 people and the maiming of 162 more. The interview was arranged with the help of the IRA leadership, but Mullen says there was a strict condition. Only I was allowed to see him without his disguise right. on the grounds I'd met him before, yes. uh, and uh, I think he trusted me. So the me crew about weren't allowed to see him. No, nobody his else disguise. saw him without his disguise right. except me. So, Mullen believes only he knew for certain the self-confessed young planter's real identity. During the programme, the man provided meticulous detail about the operation. 
we challenged the man who admits he's a bomber to mark where he left the bomb. I had the bag at my feet, here. This man has marked the seat of the explosion within three or four feet. A year later, the Birmingham Six were freed on appeal after fresh scientific evidence undermined the Crown's case. The police told us from the start that they knew we hadn't done it. They told us they didn't care who'd done it. They told us that we were selected and that they were going to frame us just to keep the people in there happy. That's what it's all about. This. Relief for the six innocent men, but agony for the victims' families. We were absolutely devastated. It was almost as if we'd lost her again. West Midlands police have set up a special team of officers to investigate new lines of inquiry into the pub bombings. In the 27 years since the police reopened the investigation, there have been no arrests, no breakthroughs, no hope for the families. Frustrated, Julie Hamilton and other relatives formed a campaign group to fight for justice. Thank you. They've pinned their hopes on a fresh inquest, hoping it would reopen the whole question of who was responsible. OK, well, good luck with you. Thank you. Hello. Thank you. But the coroner insisted this was beyond the legal remit of an inquest. How is it possible to have an inquest without mentioning the murderers? He's going to be ignoring the biggest elephant in the room. Last week, after a long legal battle, the Court of Appeal ruled in favour of the coroner. The identity of the bombers will not be considered by the inquest. For the relatives, justice feels as elusive as ever. Chris Mullin believes he knows who bombed Birmingham. He even heard a confession from the man he dubbed the young planter. In theory, he could identify him, but, he says, it's not that simple. Some of the relatives will be quite upset about it. I understand all that, but in my view, it's a matter of integrity that journalists protect their sources. It would be very convenient if I could just climb on the roof and shout out the name now, uh, um, but I declined to do so because I gave my word and it's a matter of integrity. And as a journalist, I, you'll understand that. I do understand that, but there's also the question of justice for the relatives of the people killed. And I think a lot of people would say it's time you assisted them as well. I gave repeated assurances, not only to the individual concerned, but to many innocent intermediaries uh, that I would not name names while they were alive. Uh, and I haven't, I never have done, and I never will. This isn't uh, Cluedo. Uh, we're not playing a game here. We're talking about real life, real life and death issues. But perhaps we can do something which the inquest and Chris Mullin cannot. Our investigation can shed new light on the plot, how the police cultivated an IRA informant how one terrorist slipped the country just as detectives were desperate to question him. And for the first time, we name the two prime suspects for the two bomb planters. He was very cool. He never got ratted or upset or said, what am I doing here? It was all calm, all collected and all measured. In 1974, the IRA murdered 21 people in Birmingham when they bombed two crowded pubs. I'm on the trail of the two men who planted the bombs. Several names have been linked to the plot, but West Midlands police have failed to bring anyone to justice 
to the bitter disappointment of the victim's relatives. Who in their right mind would find that acceptable? What kind of a society have we become? We're supposed to have set the benchmark for a civilised society, for the rule of law. Whilst writing his book about the case, author Chris Mullin believes he met both bomb planters. He's never named them. But within his text lie clues to their identities, in particular about the man he's called the young planter. One rainy day in the spring of 1986, I made my sixth trip to Ireland in connection with this case. The man who I went to see lives in a bleak public housing estate. He is aged around 30 and was therefore still in his teens at the time of the bombings. Mullin has refused to disclose the identity of his young planter to us, having promised him lifelong anonymity. But we know from this passage he was a teenager at the time of the bombings. The IRA had a very active unit in the West Midlands in the 1970s. Around 50 bombs were planted in the 15 months before the pub attacks. Well, these are an example of the a number of exhibits that we've recovered from the bomb factories uh, and also from the scenes of the offences where the explosions and incendiary devices went off. While the investigation of the pub bombings would be discredited, West Midlands police did have some success hunting down those responsible for other bomb attacks. In the mid-70s, there were three trials leading to 16 convictions. Those cases have left a trail of names, witness statements and police interviews. By digging out police and court documents from these cases, I've been able to identify 25 names from within the IRA's Birmingham cell. There are just two teenagers amongst them. And I've established that one of those was in custody at the time of the pub bombings. That leaves just one name. He was raised in England by Irish parents. He married young and lived in Birmingham. He worked as a labourer on building sites. His name is Michael Patrick Riley. Could he be the young planter? I tracked down one of Riley's former colleagues in the Birmingham IRA. Just outside the home of Peter Toll, he was a member of the Birmingham IRA um, with Riley, one of the few uh, that I've been able to trace. I want to ask him if he's happy to talk to me about Riley. I uh, am making a programme for uh, ITV about the Birmingham bombings 40 odd years ago. Just, just, just hear me out if you wouldn't mind. I know you weren't involved in the Birmingham bombings. Well, hang, hang on a second. Did you ever know a fellow called Michael Riley? Okay, all right, bye bye. No luck with Peter Toll, but I did find an old girlfriend of another member of the unit. Her then boyfriend recruited Riley into the IRA. For a short while, they all shared a house together in 1974. She agreed to take me back, but asked to remain anonymous. We're calling her Emma. Yeah, I'm wrong with that. There you go. What memories do you have? Not that was our room, no. Which one? The top? The first floor? The first floor. He was at the back. So Riley was living on the same floor? Yeah. As you, but at the back of the house? Yeah. What do you remember about Michael Riley? He was certainly well, more well-educated than the, the others. Mm -hmm. um, Did you feel comfortable with him? No, 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 no. He, he always said he didn't trust me, and he, he, he did tell to me. To your face, didn't yeah. he? Really? Yeah. You know, some of the things he, he would say to you, you know, like, um, nobody knows you're living here, nobody knows uh, where you are, you've got no parents. You could disappear like that. 
I was scared of him. He definitely didn't want me there. What did you discover about what was going on in some of those rooms? Just in front of us. Well, I know they were having meetings there. The IRA were having yeah. meetings? Yeah. And doing what? They were certainly planning things. After the Birmingham Six were convicted, many officers in the West Midlands Police thought they'd wrapped up the case. But new leads about the IRA cell kept emerging. One would even take them to the man we suspect to be the young planter. Bill Squires was a detective inspector in the West Midlands anti-terrorism squad. He's never spoken on television before. Two months after the Birmingham Six were convicted, Squires cultivated an informant in the IRA. The informant is still alive, so we're not naming him. Squires reveals he provided new and compelling information. We just got on and he, yeah. he told me all about the IRA. He told me how people were recruited and uh, how they drew them into it and who was in charge, who was the, the, the sergeant major. And who did what? Yes. Bomb making? Uh, all, all of that, the bomb makers, the, the trainers, the people who found accommodation, the people who took people to different addresses, and all that sort of stuff. During four days of questioning, the informant gave up a fresh name, Michael Riley. Squires tracked down Riley to a dole office. I went across to him and I said, um, are you Michael Riley? He said, yes. I said, I'm from the anti-terrorist squad yeah. and I'm arresting you. And he said, I'm a soldier. I'm not saying anymore. Which uh, just delighted me because I knew straight away I'd got the right man. We've uncovered a transcript for one of Riley's police interviews. It's never been made public before. He was interviewed by Squires' boss, Detective Chief Inspector Tom Banks. Which bombings did you do? He was very cool. He never got ratted or upset or said, what am I doing here? It was all calm all collected and all measured. I only did two. One in the Woodyard in Curzon Street and the Army and Navy place at Walsall. That's all. That's not true, is it? I know that there's at least one other offence you've committed. Yes. I did put one in the ABC in town. They told us how to split the seat and put it inside. Look, on my child's life, I swear that's all I've done. In his written statement, Riley admitted bombing a different cinema, the Odeon. He was eventually charged in connection with six bombings. No one died in these attacks. The charge sheet resembles Mullins' description of the man he called the young planter. He was involved in seven or eight bombings including one of the cinemas, an army and navy stores, one of the bombs in... Studio so, there are clear parallels between Mullins' young planter and Michael Riley. And now we've found a former IRA man who says he knows the secrets of the pub bombings. Hi, how'd you do? How are you? How are you? I'm, well, I'm from, I'm a journalist, yeah? and I was hoping to talk to you. Oh, well. Birmingham. The Birmingham pub bombings remain one of the biggest unsolved terrorism cases in British history. 21 dead and nearly 200 injured. The culprits have never been caught. Now, exposure has found evidence pointing to this man, Michael Riley, as a prime suspect for one of the bomb planters. 
Three months after the Birmingham Six were wrongly convicted, Riley was arrested by the West Midlands police. He admitted bombing some local businesses. Then, detectives questioned him about evidence from his father. He told officers that his son had warned him not to go into town on the night of the bombings. Honest to God, I've told you all I've done. I know nothing of them. You must have had some connection with these matters to be able to predict their happening. To tell you the truth, I was told there was something going to happen, but I didn't know people were going to be killed. Who told you? Mick Hayes told me. His actual words were, there's going to be some music in town tonight. Tell your father to keep out. No, he said, tell your relatives to keep out. Riley's admission that he knew in advance about the pub bombings is significant. It's similar to the initial account the young planter gave Mullin for his book. At first, he did not tell the truth, saying that he had been warned to stay at home because something big was going to happen. Might there be another person who so closely fits this description? Chris Mullin will neither confirm nor deny anything because of his lifelong undertaking to protect the young planter's identity. I want to put it to you that the young bomb planter you interviewed was a man called Michael Patrick Riley. I'm not naming that individual, whoever was the young planter. I never have, uh, and I won't do as long as he's alive. Would you accept from me that many of the things that Michael Patrick Riley uh, admitted to the police uh, he had done and what he had said are consistent with the descriptions you have given in your book about the young planter that you interviewed? Do you accept that? I'm not going there. If you want to go there, that's up to you. Well, as far as you I'm are concerned. plowing your own furrow, All right. and I am not getting involved in that particular aspect. But the detective who arrested Riley in 1975 now has a theory about why he confessed to other bombings. I thought he'd done something serious mm -hmm. and that he was happy to make admissions and accept a sentence because there was more serious matters in the locker. In other words, if he coughed up to a couple of firebombs, he Yes. Hope to get you off his back on the more serious stuff. Yes. Is, that, is that what you mean? Yes. Do you think Riley played you a bit? Oh, yes. Yes, he was. But we'd really got nothing on him. Mm. So we had to be satisfied that he would be taken out of the action mm. with a fairly hefty prison sentence. Mm. And Riley was taken out of the action. He got 10 years for conspiring and causing explosions. And there, the police investigation into Riley's possible links to the pub bombings ended, for now. But Riley had given up fresh information about one key member of the IRA cell, Michael Hayes, who Riley had told the police warned him about the pub bombings. Mick Hayes told me. His actual words were, there's going to be some music in town tonight. Tell your father to keep out. No, he said, tell your relatives to keep out. But the police never had the chance to challenge Hayes about Riley's information. Hayes had escaped to Ireland after being released by detectives three weeks earlier, leaving Squires bitterly disappointed. I was upset because he was out of reach. I mean, it's the one thing that's rankled with me ever since. What are the sort of questions you would want to have put to Hayes? About his association, association with known bombers, ordering known bombers about. It would have been very difficult in the light of that evidence for him to deny he was a member of the provisional IRA. Hayes, seen here at an IRA funeral, has been widely thought to be the older bomb planter in Mullin's book. According to several Republican sources, he was also quartermaster in the IRA's so-called England department in the 1980s. 
One published account from an ex-IRA man says Hayes supplied equipment for some of the most deadly attacks on mainland Britain. A bomb at Chelsea Barracks, which killed two people. 25 pounds of explosives surrounded by 1,100 six-inch nails tore apart a coach full of Irish guards. A car bomb that maimed a British general. And another bomb in Oxford Street, London, which killed a bomb disposal officer. In 1990, an ITV docudrama named Hayes as one of the bomb planters. Three minutes later, the second one went off. Last year, the BBC conducted the first TV interview with Hayes. Reinforcing the impression he was involved in the pub bombings, Hayes said he was an active participant in the Birmingham cell, but evaded questions about his precise role. Did you plant the bombs? <laughs> I was a participant in the Aries campaign in England. But you're not answering the question. Did you plant I'm, I'm the bombs? I'm giving you the only answer I can give you. Hayes certainly sounds like the perfect fit for the older bomb planter. Dublin. This has been Hayes's hometown since the IRA disbanded. I found him at home and secretly filmed our conversation. Hi, it's Mick Hayes, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. John Ware, how'd you do? Oh yeah, who are you? Um, well I'm from I'm a journalist. Yeah. And I was hoping to talk to you. Oh what? Birmingham? Well, I didn't do it. No, I didn't say you did. Oh. Can I come in? Yeah. Hayes was surprisingly keen to talk, quickly outlining his own role in the Birmingham IRA. Well, I was a member of the Republican movement for the first middle of period. Yeah. yeah. My objective was to make sure that the equipment was maintained and looked after, so I left mm -hmm. explosives. So were you sort of quartermaster of the unit? Or yeah. Would that yeah. be the that right been, phrase? That would have been the right, the right way of putting it, yeah. IRA sources have told me that Hayes is prone to glorifying his role in the Republican cause, and we couldn't verify some of his claims. But he repeatedly denied he planted the Birmingham pub bombs. He said he thought civilians should never be targeted, and he was ashamed. But actually, you weren't involved in Birmingham. No, I wouldn't do that. You weren't involved in the, no, pl in no, the planting. I was never involved. I wouldn't do anything like that. No. Jesus no, I understand, Christ. I understand. Jesus Christ, I'm a soldier, not a butcher. Chris Mullin also believes that Hayes did not plant the bombs. He says that in 1990, he asked the young planter who had accompanied him on the night of the bombings. I pressed him to say who the other planter was, and he wouldn't tell me. And then I said to him, was it Michael Hayes? And he looked at uh, around the room and said, look, there's a crucifix on that wall. Uh, I swear it wasn't Hayes, uh, um, which leaves only one other person. And he did say to me, you know who it was. Uh, uh, and indeed, uh, it, I, it, it must have been the person from whose house the bombs started out in Bordesley Green. And here is the street in Bordesley Green, Birmingham, where it's believed the bombs were collected. It was the home of former British soldier turned IRA terrorist, James Francis Gavin. Gavin was a senior member of the Birmingham IRA. I'm told that in 1975, police searched an address in this street and found traces of explosives in a car driven by Gavin. He was arrested but released, and he fled to Dublin the next day. We believe Gavin is the prime suspect for the older planter. Did you make the devices for Birmingham? No, no, I didn't make them, until that made them. During our secret filming, Hayes told us Gavin had a wider role in the pub bombs plot. 
Hayes says Gavin worked with this man, another member of the cell, Mick Murray, to select the targets. So would it have been Gavin? Gavin and Murray would have picked the targets. Gavin and Murray, yeah. Three years after the pub bombings, Gavin shot a man the IRA suspected to be an informant. He was convicted and given a life sentence. After the Birmingham Six were released, Gavin was visited in his cell by detectives. He refused to answer questions. The West Midlands police, I'm told, believe that Jimmy Gavin is still alive. But uh, Republican sources tell me he's dead and has been dead for quite a long time. I can see a Gavin. I can see a Gavin, a James Gavin. So what is the date? 28th of October 2002. So this is where the story ends for one of the two bomb planters. No more questions for Gavin, but plenty for the other prime suspect. I'm at the top of the escalator. He's at the top of the escalator, okay. I got him. Okay, we're ready. Let's go. We believe convicted IRA terrorist Michael Riley is the prime suspect for one of the two bomb planters who killed 21 people in Birmingham in 1974. Riley appears to fit the profile of the man who admitted planting the bombs to author Chris Mullin. That was me. This man is confessing to mass murder. During a police interview, Riley admitted he knew there was going to be an attack that night. To tell you the truth, I was told something was going to happen. We've also tracked down and secretly filmed his ex-Birmingham IRA comrade, Mick Hayes. During our conversation, Hayes made some claims which couldn't be corroborated. But on the question of who planted the Birmingham bombs, Hayes gave a clear indication of Riley's role. At first, he was guarded. Did you know that he'd been involved in the... Did you know that he was one I of the two... I knew he had a part to play, but I didn't know specifically what part it was. Like, you I knew he had a part to play? I knew he had a part to play. But later in the conversation, Hayes was more explicit about Riley. When you spoke to Mick Riley about the bombing, did he express any remorse? Oh, yeah. Oh, Mick, yeah. Mick Riley. Oh, yeah. What did he say to you? He said, how could I excuse that? Mm -hmm. I didn't know he said that. But now that, I, I never went. And he said something pathetic. I, I didn't want the, the mark of cowardice, but I mean... I, I didn't, didn't want the mark of cowardice. Cowardice. So in other words, when he was asked uh, to do the job, uh, he didn't uh, want to turn it down uh, because uh, he didn't want to be thought of a uh, uh, as a coward. How much do you think it was? Mm. It was fucking cowardice. Jesus Christ, I said. Would he have known the target, the targets were pubs before he accepted the job, or do you think he only he learned? He told us two targets. He told the last, the last seconds when the bombs were, the bombs were prime. Hayes's account tallies with Chris Mullin's book. He writes that the young planter told him they just needed a carrier, and I was available. I'm not blaming anyone or making excuses. What's done is done. Time to track down the man himself. We had only one detail to help us find Riley, and that was his date of birth. So we trawled through all the birth records and all the electoral records of the United Kingdom, and we could find only one Michael Patrick Riley with the same date of birth as the Michael Patrick Riley, who was convicted of terrorism in Birmingham in 1976. And he lives right here.
Belfast. Riley came here following his release from prison in England for terrorism offences separate from the pub bombings. And here is our prime suspect for the murder of 21 people in Birmingham in 1974. These are the first published pictures of Michael Patrick Riley after release from prison 36 years ago. He now lives in a suburb of Belfast. Michael Riley has just turned into this car park uh, on his way back home from work, and um, we're going to try and talk to him when he comes up and put the allegations to him. I'm told West Midlands police have regarded Riley as a suspect for the pub bombings since the early 1990s. He was interviewed here on three separate occasions. The CPS advised there was insufficient evidence to charge him. Moment of truth. Hello? Coming to the top of the escalator. He's at the top of the escalator, okay. I got him. Okay, we're ready. Okay. Go. Right, let's go. Um, Michael Patrick Riley, John Ware, ITV. I want to ask you about uh, what you convicted of IRA offences in Birmingham in 1976. Yes. Yes. I want to put a. I've got to put a straight question to you. Straight question. Nothing did you did you plant the bombs in the Birmingham pubs that killed 21 people? No. You didn't. No. Are you sure? No, go away. Well, I need, I need to ask you some questions. Well, you okay. what you want, but nothing Were you, in, you, in your police interviews, you did say to the police you knew the bombings were going to take place. Uh, no. Do you remember that? Nope. You don't remember that? Nope. Nothing to say. You You're wasting your time. Right. What's your fingers? Were you, you were in the IRA, were you not? You just admitted to me. I have nothing to say. You were interviewed by the police on three occasions in 1993 in Belfast, but I do believe. You talked to Chris Mullen about your bombing and you admitted it to him, did you not? Behind the bomb, your feet. Have you got anything to say to the... Don't, to, don't, hang on. Don't, you, don't, 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 I just want to ask you if you've got anything door, to say to the that, relatives. They deserve an answer. My door. Mr. Riley. Thank you. Michael Riley's solicitor told us, and I quote, our client denies all the allegations and does not intend to respond any further to the unfounded allegations you've made. The Birmingham families have waited 44 years to know who within the IRA bombed Birmingham. The inquest is unlikely to enlighten them now, so we've briefed Julie Hambleton on what we've found. Now, Julie, I want to give you the name of the man we believe to have been the uh, elder bomb planter this is James Francis Gavin. He's dead. He died in 2002. He's a former British soldier, as a matter of fact. Now, I'm going to ask you, Julie, if you've ever seen this man before. No. All right, well, let me tell you who he is. His name is Michael Patrick Riley. Uh, in that photograph, he's 19 years of age. Now. Um, we're not the police, we're not uh, the courts, uh, we can't say for certain he is the pub bomber. What we can say with a high degree of confidence, he is the prime suspect for the man who admitted to Chris Mullen on two occasions that he did plant the bombs. Is he still alive? He is still alive and he lives in Belfast. He lives in Belfast, part of the United Kingdom. He lives in Belfast. Yes. Yes, he so, does. So, so if he did do it, he's not even covered by an extradition because he's under UK law and no, legislation. That, that's correct. 
I want to show you some footage of uh, Michael Riley that we shot this year. Um, Michael Patrick Riley, John Ware, RGV. I want to ask you about uh, you convicted of IRA offences in Birmingham in 1976. Yes. Yes. Did you plant the bombs in the Birmingham pub that killed 21 people? <laughs> I just want to ask yes, you if you've got anything to say to the relatives. They deserve an answer. Mr. Riley. <laughs> we could have walked past it when they were in Belfast. <laughs> when people ask us how you think you'd react if you met them or saw them or knew them. Mm. You can't answer that question because you don't know. No, I, I get that. Mm. All eyes now turn to the inquest into the IRA's biggest mass murder on the British mainland. The courts have ruled the inquest is not the place to investigate the suspects we've named in this program. But if not the inquest, then where and when?